In our last review lesson, we are going to talk about the sorting and searching algorithms that we covered in class. In this lesson, I'm just going to review the overview of the different algorithms. I would still recommend that you familiarize yourself with the actual code of the, um, of the actual algorithms themselves. Let's go ahead and start with selection sort. So selection sort is our search and swap algorithm. And essentially the way that this algorithm works is it takes a look at an entire array and it finds the smallest element in the array and it swaps this element into the first position, position zero. And then that position is done. And so it kind of steps off to the side, so to speak. And then after that, the array now, the algorithm now finds the next smallest element from index one until the end and swaps it into position one and then finds the next smallest element and swaps it into position two and so forth. And this continues until the whole array is sorted. For an array of n elements, this array is sorted after it does n minus one passes. And the reason why this happens is because the algorithm assumes that by the time it gets down to that last element, that that last element is sorted um, by default, essentially. An important thing to recognize is that after the kth pass, so after the fourth pass or the third pass, um, k just represents how many times this algorithm has gone through. So after the kth pass, the first k elements are in their final sorted position. And the reason why those are the final sorted position is because the way that selection sort works is it finds the smallest element and sorts it, and then the next smallest element and sorts it. So if we have gone through this algorithm and done, for example, three iterations of it, then that means that the first three elements are going to be sorted. We say that a selection sort has a big O efficiency of n squared, uh, and that's essentially the worst case scenario for selection sort. Insertion sort uh, is a little bit different from selection sort. Insertion sort does not have a swap. Instead, it has more of a slide. And so the way that insertion sort works is it's going to pick an item and it's going to insert it into the proper place in a sorted sublist. And it's going to repeat this process until all of the items in the uh, array have been inserted where they belong. So in more detail, we can think of it like saying that the first element in our array, we assume the first element is already sorted. It's, in a, it's a sublist of one element, therefore that one element is sorted within itself. So my outer loop actually begins the process at index one, as opposed to my selection sort, which begins at index zero. I now begin looking at index one, which is really my second element, and I determine where this element needs to go with respect to my sorted sublist. So if needed, I will shift my first item down to make room for this new value. And I will keep on doing this process where I will shift the values down to make room for the value so that it's in its proper place. And this is similar to how you might order cards in your hand. If, um, if you're playing cards and somebody would, would deal you a new card and you realized, oh, this card has to go in between these two, so you would move a few cards down in your hand and then insert the other one in its place. So it's important to realize that insertion sort does not use a swap. That is a key trademark move of our selection sort. So if we analyze this algorithm a little bit more, um, if we have n elements, then we would say that this array is sorted after n minus one passes, and that's because we start at index one and go all the way till the end. So selection sort starts at index zero and goes until the second to last value. Insertion sort starts at index one and goes until the last value. With insertion sort after the kth pass, then the first k elements are sorted with respect to each other, but they're not necessarily in their final position. So what that means is that at that point, we have inserted um, and correctly sorted that many values, but there could be something later in the array that hasn't been addressed yet that will at a later point be inserted earlier into the array. So it's important to realize with insertion sort, if we have done four passes, for example, we know that the first four elements will be sorted. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't elements later in the array that don't belong 
earlier in the array. The worst case for insertion sort would be if the array was initially sorted in reverse order, and that's because there are the maximum number of comparisons and moves that need to be made. The best case would be if the array is already sorted, and that's because this is what's considered an adaptive sort, because when it checks to see if the values need to be moved down, if the array is already in sorted order, it will recognize that it does not need to have any shifts made, and it will progress on to the next iteration. That worst case scenario happens when the array is in reverse order, and that would give us a big O efficiency of n squared again. All right, so then we got to our uh, recursion chapter, and we learned about merge sort and quick sort. And merge sort is an AP topic, quick sort is not. So let's talk briefly about merge sort. The way that merge sort works is we first break the array into two halves. And then once we have broken the array into two halves, then we are going to do merge sort on the left and merge sort on the right. And we keep on doing this process. And the process, remember with recursion, we need a base case. And the base case for merge sort is when you have an array of size one. So once we get down to array of size one, then we recombine. And so essentially what's happening here is we are taking this array and we split it left and we split it right. And then we keep on going to the left and we split left and we split right and we split left and we split right. And now I've gotten to base case and these are both base case, so I recombine. And after this has been recombined, then I'm going to come over here and I can recombine these. And now my left side is all done. So now I can come back up here and now I can take care of the right side and do the same thing. I can split, I can split, I can recombine, I recombine, and now my left is done, my right is done, and now these can recombine. Um, the biggest advantage to merge sort is that the process that's done in the computer requires a temporary array to be used, um, which uh, does affect its efficiency. However, overall, um, the, the big O efficiency is still better than the um, insertion sort and selection sort. Its big O efficiency is n log n. All right, let's talk about some of our searching algorithms. The first one we studied is our sequential or linear search, and this is the most basic of basic searches. Here we, we use a simple loop and we begin at the, the first index and we go through and we check each entry until we find what we're looking for. And typically in a linear search, we will return the index where the value is found or we return negative one if the value is not in the array. Um, the best case for a linear search is that the entry is in the first slot. The worst case is that it's either in the last slot or it's not in there. And for that reason, the big O for a linear search would be N because if the array has 20 elements, the worst case would be that we had to check all 20 of them. Now, binary search is much more efficient. However, in order to perform a binary search, the elements must be in a sorted array. That is a precondition of a binary search. Now, the way that binary search works is it essentially, essentially uses a divide and conquer uh, mentality. Kind of like, imagine if you were looking in a dictionary for a word, and let's say you were looking for the word, um, I don't know, search, and you opened up the dictionary, and the first word that you saw was um, man, and you realize that search came later in the dictionary, then you would ignore everything from the word man before it, and you would then focus your efforts on the second half of the dictionary. And so then you would take what was left of the dictionary and you cut it in half again. And let's say you then got the word um, Sam, and Sam also comes before search. So you would chop off everything from Sam before it, and you would focus your efforts from the first word after Sam till the end of the dictionary and so forth. And that's how our binary search works. So we essentially continue to cut this array in half over and over until we find the value that we're looking for or realize that it's not there. So binary search is going to return the index where the value is found or it will return negative one if it's not in the array. And the best case scenario is that the element is found on the first check. The worst case is that it's simply not in the array or it's the first or last element of the array. Now, a common question is asking us um, the maximum number of comparisons to find if a value is in the array. And so the way that we wanna do that is we wanna look at how many times would I have to 
cut the array in half until I have um, solved the question. And so the easiest way to do that is to find the next power of 2 greater than n. So for example, if I had an array of 20 elements, then I would look at powers of 2, and I would recognize that 2 to the 4th is 16, and 2 to the 5th is 32. So because 16 is not big enough yet, I would need to go up to the 32. So that tells me that 5 is the maximum number of comparisons that it would take for this array of 20 elements in order to find the value using a binary search. And binary search has a big O efficiency of log n base 2, or that's sometimes just abbreviated log n. In terms of what to study, you do not need to memorize sorting code. Your FRQs are not going to ask you to write a sorting algorithm. Um, you most likely will have to write some type of basic linear search. Uh, that's a very common thing to need to do, but that's just a basic for loop. Um, you do need to be very familiar with how the algorithms work. It's really common to see a multiple choice question where you are given the code for, for example, insertion sort. They don't tell you it's insertion sort, and then they ask you, what would the array look like after four iterations? Well, if you recognize it's insertion sort, then you can just follow the insertion sort algorithm that we've learned without tracing the code, but by just tracing the, the array, which is much quicker, and you can answer the same question, uh, and that helps you greatly. You might also see a multiple choice question where it's a selection sort, for example, and they say, you know, this is the code, but it's not working the way that it should. What's wrong with it? What do I need to do to fix it? So in this case, again, you don't have to memorize the code, but you need to know the algorithms well enough to be able to fix it so that it behaves the way that a selection sort should. The third bullet point here says you should know how the array will look after k passes or how many elements are in their final sorted position after k passes. And this is an example of if we give you an array and we tell you it was sorted using this algorithm, how would it look? So in this case, they won't even give you the code. You have to understand the process well enough to be able to think like a computer and figure out how it would look after you know, three passes or four passes without having the code to trace. And then lastly, knowing best and worst cases. And if this is something that you don't recall, you can just do a quick Google search to, um, to refresh your memory on those. All right, that's it. Have a great day.